Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's uh, GA seminar. Uh, for those that don't already know me, uh, my name's David Robinson. I'm part of the senior leadership team here at Geoscience Australia, uh, and under my remit, I run the Basin Systems branch, which uh, includes uh, our involvement, Geoscience Australia's involvement in the Australian New Zealand IODP consortium, all of which we'll hear uh, about today. So to uh, actually, before I introduce the seminar and the presentation, I would like to acknowledge um, the lands upon which we meet uh, and pay my respects to uh, the traditional owners of these lands, the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and also uh, pay my respects to any elders past, present or emerging who are joining us today in the audience or online. I'd also like to extend um, that respect to the lands upon which we at Geoscience Australia work, which covers really the entire country and uh, offshore continental zone. Today, we uh, have a second of two presentations in a row uh, that are related to the IODP. So it's very exciting today to uh, welcome the second of these presentations. Um, today's seminar is around sampling the subsurface future opportunities for Australia in international scientific drilling. It'll be presented by Dr. Ron Hackney and Dr. Sarah Kacevic. Both speakers are from the Australia and New Zealand IODP consortium, which is known as ANZIC amongst its friends. Ron is the director of ANZIC and Sarah is the program manager. Scientific drilling through the International Ocean Discovery Program and the International Continental Drilling Program is a key contributor to understanding the Earth's lithosphere, biosphere, cryosphere and atmosphere. As the highly successful IODP, IODP collaboration prepares for renewal, community interest in scientific drilling remains very high with numerous proposals under consideration throughout the world ocean, and also a lot of work being done around commissioning new dedicated scientific drilling vessels to support expand the expansion of um, oceanic drilling in particular. Uh, the infrastructure will continue to complement ICDP, the International Continental Drilling Program, for scientific drilling on land. Today, we're going to hear about Australia's involvement in IODP. Uh, and so I will welcome now the presenters. I'll say a few things about each of them. Dr. Ron Hackney um, commenced at the Australian National University as the director of ANZIC in mid-2022. That follows 14 years at Geoscience Australia. So he's very well known to many of us here. Um, where he worked on a range of national pre-competitive geoscience projects. Prior to that, he had six years in Germany, first as a postdoc at the Freie Universität of Berlin and as a junior professor for solid earth geophysics at Christian Albrechts University in Kiel. Ron has a PhD from the University of Western Australia, a master's in science in geophysics from Victoria University of Wellington, and a Bachelor of Science in Honours from the Australian National University. Dr. Sarah Kacevic commenced at the Australian National University as the ANZIC Program Manager in late 2021, and was re recently announced as a superstar of STEM for 23 and 24. So well done, Sarah by the Science and Technology uh, Australia. Previously, Sarah spent three years sailing as a marine technician on board the IODP research vessel, the Joides Re Resolution from Texas A&M University. She has a PhD in Radiolarian Micropaleontology from the University of Queensland, where she has also sailed on IODP Expedition 362 to the Sumatra Subduction Zone. She also holds a Bachelor of Science in, with honours from the University of Wollongong. So without further ado, uh, I believe the presentation will begin with Ron. So, yeah, David. Thanks, David. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's a little surreal to be here, as, as David said, after that long history here at GA, but I'm um, really pleased to be here here to talk to you about uh, Australia's involvement in these scientific drilling initiatives. 
And uh, you know, I'm going to give you a, a presentation here, just a sort of a, a bit of a history for those not so familiar, a bit of status where we're at and where we're maybe heading. Um, afterwards, uh, Sarah's got some bits and pieces here, and I uh, encourage you to hang around after the talk if you want to have a bit of a play with some replica cores and look for some microfossils and that kind of thing. And then if you do that, you'll see why Sarah is a superstar of STEM. Um, so today, what I want to do, I've said, I'll just give you a brief history of the uh, International Scientific Ocean Drilling. There'll be a bit of a concentration on that. I'll talk about the science drivers that are going to drive that sort of uh, that program or those programs going into the, you know, the next couple of decades. Um, I'll talk about some of the immediate opportunities for Australian researchers, um, and that really goes down to these institutions of which, that are a member of this ANZIC consortium. Um, Geoscience Australia is one of those members, and it does mean that people at Geoscience Australia can avail themselves of some of those opportunities. I'll talk about some of the emerging opportunities in terms of uh, you know, thinking about how we're going to try and go forward to secure a bit of um, long-term sustainability for our involvement in these programs. Um, and at the very end, I'm going to touch on a um, uh, just, I guess, a bit of a, an immediate pathway forward where we've got a workshop coming up in April to try and set some of the direction. So uh, David's already undertaken an acknowledgement of country, but I'd also just like to uh, acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and uh, today and pay our respects to elders past and present. Um, we're meeting today on the Ngunnawal land, and I know that uh, you are all the people online probably perhaps meeting from uh, from other country around around Australia. So first up, a brief history of, uh, of IODP. Um, I'm going to try and use a little laser pointer on here so people online can see too, hopefully. Um, so you know, these, these ocean drilling programs have been going for you know, 55 odd years now. Um, there's a range of the different ones listed on the screen there. The deep sea drilling program, the ocean drilling program, two versions of the IODP. I guess there was a bit of a change at one point when, when drilling was not so much the flavour that you wanted to get across. So it sort of became the International Ocean Discovery Program. But before all of that, uh, back in the early 1960s, uh, the very first expedition was the Mohole expedition. And this was, a, a, uh, I guess, a US funded expedition. Um, there's a picture on the left there of the, uh, of the people on that expedition. Notably, the guy William Riedel there is an Australian. So he was one of the co-chiefs on this very, very first expedition. And the target of that expedition was to reach the base of the Earth's crust, uh, the, the Moho. Uh, I think uh, you know that's it's shown in that sort of picture here, some oceanic crust and uh, the, the base of the Moho. So in that sense, the, uh, the expedition was not a success. They did not get to the Moho, uh, but this was really the first time that the technology was put in place to go and drill in these, uh, in these ocean basins. Uh, it was the first time there was a vessel that had a dynamic positioning system to be able to keep the ship in one spot uh, so it didn't move around and then you could set all the, um, the drilling uh, equipment uh, down into the ocean, down into the hole and, and keep the ship in place over that hole. So it was a huge technological success. Um, John F. Kennedy was the president at that time uh, and sent a telegram to these people congratulating them on these giant leaps forward. So that's really the basis for, uh, for all the future, you know, all the ocean, scientific ocean drilling that came, came after that. So all of these programs, I guess they're some of the longest collaborations, um, scientific collaborations uh, in, in, ever. Uh, I believe I've heard that there's only one I think it's a meteorological collaboration that's been going longer. So there's a, you know, five, over five decades of, uh, of collaboration between various different countries, a lot of um, you know, going past the geopolitics. So some of the very first partners in these ocean drilling programs were West Germany, Russia and the United States. Uh, so um, yeah, it's some, 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 some great uh, collaborative work. So these days, um, the IODP, the International Ocean Discovery Program, um, it's uh, it's the successor for the, for the DSDP, the ODP. At the moment, there's uh, there's 21 nations represented. You can see the flags there on a the map. Um, there's three drilling platform providers. So that's three groups who provide a, a drilling vessel. Uh, the US provides the Joides Resolution, which is 45 years old this year. Um, you know, the workhorse of the program. The Japanese have the uh, the Chikyu. There's a model of Chikyu down here, which Stephen's kindly brought along today for everyone to have a look at. Uh, there's a European consortium for scientific ocean drilling, and they tend to contract vessels uh, for, for specific purposes. So they can bring vessels into ice covered areas, into shallower water, uh, using a geotechnical vessel or a vessel that can even deploy some of the newer uh, seabed drilling systems. So like I said, there's, there's 21 nations make up this, uh, this program at the moment. Uh, there's a few that are sort of almost there. South Korea was a member up until last year, but uh, were unsuccessful in getting their funding. And of course, Australia and New Zealand are part of this program through, through the ANZIC consortium. 
So what has this program achieved? Uh, there's a table here showing uh, over that 55 years, uh, we've collected 462 kilometres of core. Um, and again, there's some examples of the core down on the side here. So you can picture one of those. It's they're, they're usually about a metre long and there's 462 kilometres of those. There's been hundreds of expeditions. You can see that in the table below there. Um, you know, through those various programs over that 55 year history, um, you know, several thousand, you know, hundreds, probably a couple of thousands of sites where the vessel has gone to uh, and each site they tend to do multiple holes. So there's been thousands of holes drilled around the ocean, these ocean basins to achieve all that, uh, all that uh, 462 kilometres of core, which is all very well carefully archived in various repositories around the world. Um, this this great map here that Sarah's put together with the with the um, I'm not sure if many of people have seen this spillhouse projection, but it's a really cool way of, of visualizing the world ocean, uh, the one ocean, the interconnectedness of all of that. Um, you know, because it's a, a kind of a a bit of a crazy projection in a way. Just maybe quickly, Antarctica in the middle here. Here's Australia, the east coast of South sorry the west coast of South America and and, and North America, uh, Africa here and up to to Greenland at the top. And what you can see in this map as it cycles through, the yellow dots on that map are the uh, ocean drilling sites that have been drilled in the past. Uh, so you can see there's a pretty good coverage of the world world's ocean, maybe some concentration on some of the most interesting tectonic features. There's a few maybe gaps there where we haven't collected data yet. Uh, that's probably partially logistical, probably partially, partially the challenges of ultra deep water and that kind of thing and the remoteness. Um, so you know, there's, there's, there is a pretty good coverage from those thousands of holes. And I think it'll flick up in a moment. You may have seen it in there that the blue, the blue dots that show up there, um, not there yet. Has anyone seen the blue dots yet? Yes, here they are. Good. So the blue dots are the sites that are currently in the system as proposed sites to drill around the world's ocean. So there's you know, several hundred of those. Uh, there's around about 90 proposals in the system uh, that are being considered for, for you know, under review or being considered for scheduling onto a drilling vessel. An image on the left there, you can see the Joides resolution, which is also, uh, you know, that I mentioned before, is the workhorse of the program. Um, okay, yep. Yeah, so the only difference there is that 462 kilometres comes up again. I'll skip on to the next one. So in our region, um, and we like to think of our region as, I guess, the region around Australia, New Zealand, and around Antarctica as well, because uh, at the moment ANZIC is the only, you know, Australia and New Zealand are the only member countries in the southern hemisphere. Um, and on this map here, you can see in, in white, I guess, are, are, are sites that are proposed. Uh, there's some some yellow ones there that are, I guess, expeditions which are, uh, you know, with the, uh, the, vet, the the platform providers for, uh, you know, for scheduling potentially. Um, you can see one up the top here, which will be maybe well known to some of you who've been around at GA for a bit. Uh, this was the, the Lord Howe Rise proposal that GA led uh, in uh, using the Chikyu to drill on the Lord Howe Rise into the sedimentary basins there. Um, and uh, you know that some of these expeditions are, are waiting on also some some co-funding arrangements. On this map as well, there's a there's a green one here, which is an expedition which is all ready to go. It's just waiting for a platform. Um, and there's some red sites on here, which are I guess the way we call them uh, orphan sites. So they're sites that were never actually um, able to be drilled for various reasons, weather delays, technical issues. You know there might have been a, a site or two that was was had to be uh, dropped off at the end of these expeditions. So yeah, so for those who are online, Sarah's just pointed out that 813, the green one down here off Antarctica, uh, this is a this is a, a an expedition being led by the European Consortium, and they're very keen to get hold of the uh, the Noyina, uh, the new uh, Australian icebreaker, to um to to deploy one of these seabed drilling systems over the side of the uh, or, or through the moon pool of this um which is the hole in the middle of the vessel, uh, to to do that drilling on the seafloor. Um, so yeah, I guess there's there's a lot of discussions are going to go on over the next few years to see how we can go about uh, getting some time scheduled on the Noina. Okay, so I'd just like to take a few minutes now to talk a little bit about, about the impact of scientific ocean drilling, and I'm just going to you know run through a few examples here. Of, I think sort of demonstrate you know what what the um what the benefits of this program are and 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 how how the program has had an impact. So the first one here is is understanding plate tectonics and the next great earthquake. Um, so this sort of goes back way back to the, uh, I guess, into the 1960s as well, where this kind of social scientific ocean drilling was able to sample the uh, the basalt basaltic oceanic crust either side of the mid ocean ridges where the the tectonic plates are separating, for example, between Africa and South America. 
um, and actually then collect those samples, be able to um, date the rocks, work out how old they are, and see that sy symmetry in the ages e either side of those mid-ocean ridges. So that's what kind of drilling is to get, you know, get through some of the sediment layers that are on top of the oceanic crust and then be able to work out the age and then help constrain those, those plate tectonic ideas. Um, there's a lot of work going on, especially off Japan and, uh, and uh, some of the other big subduction zones to under understand subduction zone earthquakes. For example, Japan was very quick with the Chikyu after the, the, the 2011 Tohoku earthquake to send the vessel out to try and drill into that, uh, that fault zone to look at, you know, the, the, and I think they instrumented the borehole with, a, with an observatory to, to monitor the temperature and stress and pressure changes over time. So without this ocean drilling, again, it's the only way you can get access to some of these really critical zones that you know, define parts of the plate tectonic process. Um, there's been a lot of work to understand uh, geological hazards. Again, the earthquakes that I mentioned, and I've put up just a couple of pictures to compare here. The top image there is the Colombo volcano, which is near Santorini in Greece. Uh, these pictures aren't quite at the same scale, uh, but there's a striking similarity or familiarity perhaps between that Colombo volcano which was drilled were nearby was drilled nearby there, looking at the, I guess the ash and tephra layers from that volcano um, just uh, last couple of months. So that expedition finished last week, and uh, you know it's, it's, a, it's a drilling to understand that history. And there's some remarkable similarities when when we look at a volcano like that and the uh, and the Hunga Tonga Hunga Hayapi. I'm not sure if I pronounced that right. Uh, image of that volcano that erupted a year or just over a year ago um, off Tonga. Uh, you can see in some of these images that there's a lot of similarities and by drilling in the, around these volcanoes or sometimes even in the craters um, then we can you start to get a bit more of an understanding of the history and the likely future um, uh, risks from these volcanoes. The next example here to touch on is uh, I guess you know one of the key things of scientific ocean drilling has been able to access the sediment archives in the world's oceans to understand the past climate change and I think it's pretty fair to say that without the ocean drilling, we wouldn't know what we know about climate change in the past, and we wouldn't be able to, uh, you know, be, we wouldn't be informing ourselves as well as we can of what might happen in the future, uh, in the in the face of the anthropogenic climate change. So uh, yeah, th that's a really key finding. The history can go back 100 million years, almost 200 million years of that past climate history, looking at tipping points in the past. You know, what's what's you know what are the what are the risks as we go forward. Um, the next example here, which is which, you know, I think people here may have heard me talk about this one before, but you know, I find it quite fascinating the, the information we can get from the subsea floor on the on the, the limits of life. You know, what's what are the extreme habitats that life can still live in? And this is one of my favorite examples. There's a picture here of the of the Chikyu drilling off Japan, uh, where they drilled into two and a half kilometer, two and a half kilometers below the sea floor in I think it was a couple of thousand meters of water depth as well uh, into coal beds that were uh, 20 million years old. And from those coals, they were able to extract microbes uh, and resurrect them essentially in the in the laboratory, bring them back to life. But those microbes had never died. So they had actually still been there for those 20 million years, still uh, metabolized, not probably not metabolizing, but you know, living, surviving off very limited nutrients, nutrients that we might not think of like carbon dioxide giving off methane. Um, but they'd evolved also really, really slowly. And some of the characteristics of those microbes are still very, very similar to the microbes you find in a swamp near the surface, uh, near the surface today. So these microbes have been buried, their, 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 their environment had become very extreme, but they still managed to survive. And when you gave them a bit of food, they were very happy and, and all came back to life. Um, so the next example here, I'm not sure if I'm gonna be able to get that one to go, but come in. Um, is understanding some of these mass, mass extinction events. Um, it doesn't look like the video is going to go anyway. So uh, scientific ocean drilling again allows us to access those sediment archives in the oceans that record some of these past chaotic, you know, extreme events like meteorite impacts. The classic one of those is the uh, the impact that, that, that uh, wiped out the dinosaurs 65, 65, 66 million years ago. Um, and what's shown in the example on the left here is uh, a couple of examples of cores collected you know, oh, five or six years ago, I think the Expedition 364 was, um, and that was drilled into the crater, the Chicxulub crater, where the, uh, where, you know, the, the crater that was the cause of the, the demise of the dinosaurs. And, uh, and you can see in this, uh, this, this lower one here, all this dark stuff is melted rock. Um, and what I would have shown in, the, uh, in, in the, the video here is, where you can see some of it here, 
Within about 20 seconds of the impact, there was a hole in the Earth's crust that was 20 kilometres or so deep. Uh, on the edges of that crater, there were mountain ranges that were higher than Mount Everest uh, within 20 seconds. And all of that settled down within about five minutes uh, and into the atmosphere. And we've got one of this, the replica cores here of that time as well that was a bit uh, remote from that uh, from that impact. But it shows you, that I guess, the material, the debris, the melt rock, the, um, the spherules that got thrown out of the, uh, the crater. So again, the scientific ocean drilling has, has helped us understand some of these mass, mass extinction processes, and that has, of course, implications on understanding planetary geology as well. And the, the microbial life stuff is also relevant when we're you know, looking and exploring for life on, on other planets. Okay, so I just want to touch on now on some of the science drivers behind this program, what's driving the program, you know, the objectives and some of the, the enabling elements that support that. Um, but the main thing that the, I guess is guiding this international community now is a, is a community driven science priorities, which are laid out in this 2050 science framework. Um, so you know, that lay, lays out some of the strategic objectives, which I'll touch on in a moment as well. Um, it includes some of these flagship initiatives, uh, which I guess the, the intention there is to string together various expeditions over a longer period of time, given that we know that we can't necessarily answer some questions with a single expedition in one place. Uh, so we might need to go to multiple places, but that will you know, have to happen over years. So the idea is to try and uh, you know, come up with programs. One of the examples is ground truthing future climate change. You know, looking at you know, what sort of systematic places can we go, what places can we go to systematically to understand some of those uh, climate change uh, impacts. Um, I'll also touch again on the enabling elements, which are the things that uh, I guess happened to support the program and, and add value to the program as well. So on the strategic objectives, um, of course, they, they cover a broad earth science research areas. Uh, they, the foundation of this scientific ocean drilling you know, decided by the community. There are plenty of Australians involved and New Zealand is involved in setting this pathway. Um, and it's also a focus on understanding interconnections within the earth system. And you can see some of those strategic objectives. Unsurprisingly, understanding Earth's climate system is there. Um, the continuing to understand the habit habitability of, of life on earth. I think some of the emerging areas there include looking for um, uh, ancient DNA in some of these marine sediments. Uh, and recent expeditions um, led by Linda Ambrecht in, uh, at University of Tasmania, they've been able to trace DNA, you know, leftover DNA from some of these, these microbes, creatures, whatever, back you know, almost 100 million years, uh, and be able to extend some of these, uh, these I guess, these, these climate histories and, and, and atmospheric histories based on that DNA in, that's preserved in the sediments. Um, so the oceanic cycle of tectonic plates is still there, global cycles, feedbacks in the Earth system, natural hazards and how they impact society. Uh, and I've mentioned before already some of these tipping points. So this is the essence of the program and the drivers of the program going forward. Uh, in terms of these enabling elements, um, you know, the first one there is uh, broader impacts and outreach. Um, of course, there's some really great stories involved in this and hopefully some of those examples I talked about a moment ago uh, really sort of show the, the excitement that can come out of this. So it's about making sure we're still you know, doing the right sort of out, outreach to make the impact with the educators, policymakers, and the general public. Um, the second one here, I'll come back to a bit later when we're talking about this land to sea. Uh, so there's been a bit more of a recognition in the recent years that uh, there's a lot of opportunities to link together the drilling that happens on the continents and carry that out to uh, what we understand on the, uh, on the oceans. For an example, at the moment, the Australian Antarctic Division is setting up to drill million year ice core in, in Antarctica. Uh, but what can we do to compare that million year climate history from the ice with uh, sediments in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the marine, uh, in the continental margins around Antarctica or on the southern Great Barrier Reef or in lakes in Australia? So trying to come up with programs where we link that land to sea sort of initiative. Um, the other one here is the terrestrial to extraterrestrial. So there's a lot of opportunity to develop and test technologies on collecting these microbial samples. Obviously, we've got to do that in a way that we don't contaminate everything. Um, and we can test that on, on Earth before we try and do some of these things, perhaps on, uh, on other planets or the, or the, the moons of other planets. Um, the fourth one that's listed there is obviously the, the, the technology development and also the big data analytics, which is a, a common theme across science these days, I guess. Um, but there's a lot more that we can still do for developing some of the, the, the technology, the drilling and coring and logging and even observatories that get deployed in the sub, subsurface in the sea, on the seafloor to, uh, to understand or to, to monitor change. Um, and some of these things that we're looking at is you know, really the, the real-time data from borehole 
uh, observations. So that's some of these observatories which get get put into the uh, into the seafloor. Um, I'm not going to say too much about those observatories, but I know David asked a question about that last week, and Sarah has put together some more information on that, which we can talk about afterwards as well. Um, but also, you know, as we're going into more and more extreme environments, trying to detect, you know, even lower concentrations of this micro microbial life or evidence of past microbial life, wanting to make sure that we can do that without contaminating the samples. Um, and IODP, uh, with that 55 year history, there's a lot of opportunities for, to apply various analytical techniques, artificial intelligence, um, looking at the, you know, the, the different data in that in those archives to uh, to try and improve our understanding of, of the Earth system. OK, so the next topic I want to touch on is some of these immediate opportunities. Um, and like I said, GA is the member of ANZIC uh, and a significant contributor now and hopefully into the future. Um, you know, there's there's opportunities which I'll touch on. So opportunities to sail on some of these voyages, uh, opportunities to apply for some analytical funding, which you know potentially could be set up to supplement some of the work that goes on here at Geoscience Australia. Um, and it hosts a, a marine geoscience masterclass, which is typically for undergraduate students. But I can't see any reason why we couldn't, for example, have some of our some of GA's graduates potentially take part in that uh, that training course as well. Um, and also there's opportunities as a science committee, and I'll, I'll, I won't say more now because I'll just repeat myself. So in terms of expeditions, um, the list of, of, uh, of, of expeditions on the screen here is uh, you know, 2023. There's uh, six expeditions which are scheduled. Um, the, the, the participants on those expeditions has already been decided. So um, the Hellenic Arc volcanic field is the one that just finished. Um, the building blocks of life on the Atlantis Massif in the, in the Atlantic Ocean is um, starting up uh, in a couple of months uh, and there's a couple of others here and uh, later this year as well this Hawaiian drowned reefs um, drowned there's an ED missing uh, Hawaiian drowned reefs is uh, is uh, starting up and the, the significance of this one is this is a, an Australian led uh, expedition so one of the co-chiefs on that expedition is Jody Webster at the University of Sydney um, and again I think that the expeditions for that have just been decided um, future opportunities coming up. The the first two here for next year are actually uh, you know the, the, the decisions on expeditions are being made at the moment. Um, there's a there's a call open at the moment, closing on the first March, to be involved in an expedition uh, in the Fram Strait, looking at uh, paleo climate. Um, and then there's a few other expeditions coming up over over the next year as well. Maybe one could be of particular interest here, which I have discussed with the groundwater people here um, a few weeks ago, or Sarah and I came over for a, a bit of a discussion, this New England shelf hydrogeology. And I'm going to touch on that hydrogeology aspect of scientific drilling and what, what it might be able to offer uh, as, as I uh, later on in the presentation. Um, so going on with some of these opportunities, uh, you know, there's a call out for the sailing on the expedition. There's also a call coming out very soon uh, for these legacy analytical funding. So ANZIC provide grants of up to twenty thousand dollars to to apply, you know, to do research on existing samples. Um, so you know, perhaps there's some samples that have been collected around Australia that you know, could add to some of the story of of what we're looking at uh, in the uh, on the Australian margin. Um, uh, there's also fund those funds can be available for developing educational products, um, and we're also looking at novel projects focused on areas that you know aren't traditionally addressed. Uh, in uh, in scientific drilling projects, so that could be some of this big data and anal analytics, you know, trying to apply some and some AI to some 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 various um, uh, you know, data that's uh, that's with the the um, IODP archives. So there is a call open for this at the moment, closing on the 17th of April. If you've got any ideas or want to discuss something, then you know, get in touch with us by all means, and we'll we'll see what we can what we can do. Um, so these projects, we the idea is by the time we go through the process, set up little contracts and things. They'll start in the first of August, and they'll need to be finished by about December next year, because at the moment our funding is secure until the end of 2024. Um, so yeah, this has been quite a successful program, and over the last uh, 10 years or so, has handed out almost one and a half million dollars for 91 of these uh, ALEF projects. They're a really good way, especially for early career researchers to um, to get on. The, I'm getting a hurry up here from from Sarah. Um, the ANZIC masterclass, look, I don't think there's too much more to say there. Um, there's a call out to host that. Uh, like I said, in the future, there's there's surely potential for um, for, for um, some of the early career people at GA potentially to get involved in it as well. Uh, so watch this space for an announcement about where the next one will be. Um, there's another opportunity here is that you know, some of these uh, our partners in this case in Europe offer uh, training courses downhole logging for IODP science. This is also a call open. We'll be able to send one person from Australia, one from New Zealand to take part in that course. Um, so again, that's all on the, the web page. Come and talk to us if you if you've got any interest. 
Um, the last one here just to mention is the, uh, the ANZIC Science Committee. Uh, this committee, I guess, uh, reports to the Governing Council. Um, Chris Pygram is the chair of our Governing Council at the moment. Uh, there's representatives from the, uh, from the Australian and New Zealand partners. Underneath that sits this science committee, which uh, you know, helps to shape some of the science and support the, uh, the decision on expeditioners, uh, these, uh, these legacy funding grants and that kind of thing. So at the moment, we're looking for people to, uh, to join that, that committee. It would be really great if uh, someone from GA could join that committee as well. Or um, I, I think the last person to be on the science committee from GA was Irina Borisova, who may be known to some of you as well. So this call is open again, closing in mid-March as well. So. Just a little bit of time now on the uh, on the future where we're going next. Uh, so I want to talk about our, our, I guess our plans, our strategy to uh, to move from you know our funding at the moment comes under an ARC leaf, which is a linkage infrastructure and I can't remember what it stands for. So, so it's a ARC infrastructure funding program, uh, moving more into the increased side of things, uh, the national collaborative research infrastructure strategy, um, and I'll talk more about that how that links with Oscope in a moment. And then I'll touch on how that opens up potentially some other opportunities through the International Continental Drilling Program, which Australia is, is not a member of at the moment and hasn't been for some time. And then I'll talk on this concept of uh, virtual expeditions as well. So first up, uh, I mentioned that you know, going forward and any day now, we, we're expecting a, a call from, from uh, the Department of Education for, for uh, proposals under this NCRIS, uh, this NCRIS program. Uh, and we've been having a lot of discussions with uh, Oscope about uh, you know, ANZIC coming under Oscope as a new project or program, however you call it, within Oscope. Um, this has also been the recommendation of the Department of Education to, for ANZIC to team up with a, with a like-minded uh, existing NCRIS entity rather than become a new entity. Uh, I guess that's much simpler in terms of governance arrangements and all that kind of thing. So I think Oscope here will be known to many of you as a you know it's a connector within Australian within the Australian geoscience community. It provides the integrated infrastructure and and you know systems for industry, research, policy, and educational communities. Um, so uh, in that sense, you know the, the current sort of scope of uh, of Oscope is around earth imaging, earth sounding, uh, geodesy, and geodynamics. I won't go through them all there. I think this sort of the recognition a little bit is a lot of these things are about acquiring data, conducting, undertaking models, but perhaps there's a little bit of a gap in terms of accessing samples and looking after those samples after we've got them. So the idea is that ANZIC might come under Oscope and, uh, and sort of enhance the capabilities there through providing a, a little bit more um, capability for sampling and instrumenting the crust. Um, that's, you know, can be onshore and offshore. Um, you know, the expanded observational capacity potentially. Um, there's also discussions going on about uh, you know, uh, you know, coordinating sample data storage and curation a little bit. I think GA obviously does it pretty well with everything that they've got there, but I guess everybody who knows an academic knows that they've probably got buckets or boxes of rocks under their desk and what's going to happen with all of those going forward. Um, the other aspect that's maybe coming in here, there's some discussions going on with MINEX CRC about buying time on their uh, um, coil tube drilling rig, the new technology drilling rig that they're developing as well, and making that time available to researchers, uh, not just to the geological surveys, uh, you know, and ex ex I guess expanding some of that uh, in, in the future, some of those opportunities. So, yeah, I think I probably said most of what's on here, but you know, the idea is that you know, Oscope's in, you know, this infrastructure that Oscope provides will be enhanced by this uh, membership of IODP, hopefully an expanded membership, which allows more participation from Australia and New Zealand in these programs, and then adding in the continental drilling program side of it. Um, so, uh, you know, some of the other ideas that have been talked about uh, is providing some funds to support getting seismic equipment onto to vessels uh, that might sort support site surveys. Uh, but, you know, these these discussions are still still going on. And I think I've talked about the other things, new drilling capabilities. You know, is there an opportunity to utilise the, um, the MINEX CT coil tube drilling rig um, and virtual expeditions come into that and I'm going to touch on them as we go through as well. And uh, like I said, any time now we're going to get a call. Uh, it could be open for about two weeks, so um, it's going to be a, a pretty crazy time potentially when that call comes. So for the last part of this, I just want to talk about some of these future opportunities. The first one I want to talk about is the International Continental Drilling Program. Um, it's got a 27 year history. There's 22 member countries and then also UNESCO. I think the idea is that UNESCO is covering participation from some of the developing countries around the world. Um, I guess some of the themes of the ICDP are very similar to IODP around geo resources, 
Uh, they have a very big focus in the geo resources theme around geothermal energy, um, environmental change, geohazards, um, and uh, you know, also the geodynamic processes. Um, and in recent times, there's this been more collaboration with between ICDP and IODP about setting up these land to sea drilling projects. So ICDP has also been very successful over its 27 year history. There's been 350 odd proposals. They've spent you know, tens of millions of, of US dollars on, on these drilling projects. Um, they've uh, the, the, the red dots on that map show that you know that the past drilling expedition is there's more than 50 of those. Um, the green ones, are, I guess, uh, projects that are in, in, in preparation are undergoing at the moment. Uh, the yellow ones are proposals. Um, and I think if you came to the managed to make it to the presentation last week, there's a there's a dot down here, which is the new Caledonia drilling project, which we heard about last week, which is a land to sea project dr to drill the um, the new Caledonia Ophiolite. Um, what you will notice here is there's there's no dots in Australia, so we we haven't been uh, had the opportunity to to, to uh, engage with this process. I'll give you a couple of examples of some of the ICD projects that which we are or you know potentially could be involved in. Um, the first one I'll touch on is one that that uh, with support from Oscope we're supporting as a as a, I guess a, a, a trial of membership into the ICDP, and that's the Swace 2C project, um, which is sensitivity of the West Antarctic ice sheet to two degrees of, of warming. Um, and really, this is about drilling through the Ross Ice Shelf. Uh, you can see the Ross Ice Shelf here. South Pole's up up the top of the image there. Uh, drilling through the ice, the ice, the floating ice shelf through the water column, potentially instrumenting the water column uh, to you know, monitor some of the oceanographic processes, the water chemistry, and then drilling into the sediments to try and understand the past changes, and then to look at how this marine-based ice sheet will respond in the future to uh, to the global warming that we're anticipating. Uh, the second one I'll touch on just here quickly is, well, is this New Caledonia drilling project, which uh, we heard even more about last week. Uh, so you can see a map here which shows you know, New Caledonia up, up the top here. Uh, the New Caledonia ophelite has now been just demonstrated to potentially ex demonstrated to extend quite a significant distance offshore. Uh, so the idea of this is uh, is to drill this this ophiolite, looking at the you know the, I guess the process is developing the mineral deposits, the nickel, uh, the chromium, and cobalt. Uh, the you know, New Caledonia provides I think 30%, something like 30% of the world's nickel supplies. Um, another area of interest here is there are a lot of um as a result of the alteration processes going on in this ophiolite, there's a lot of um hydrogen seeps, natural hydrogen seeps in this region. Uh, so there's some efforts there as part of that to understand the the processes behind that uh, that hydrogen formation. Um, and I understand uh, Margot Goddard, the, the, the lead proponent on this, had some some discussions last week with Andrew Feitz and his team around this, this the hydrogen aspects of this project. Another project just to mention um, is uh, this project Redrill, which is a deep drilling of a, of a rare earth element, uh, alkaline carbonatite in Malawi. Uh, this is this is a project that's at the I, I guess the workshop stage. There's been a proposal submitted. If the proposal gets through the first step, then there's a workshop organised. Um, there's a, a guy at Curtin University, Chris Clark. Uh, even though I, I, Australia is not part of, IOD, of ICDP, uh, he'll be he's been invited to attend that workshop, which is maybe a goodwill gesture from the um, from the I, ICDP management, knowing that we're sort of interested in coming on board. Uh, but this is another example of the kinds of projects that may be interested in interesting to to Australian researchers in terms of that uh, providing expertise into a project like that, and then bringing back the knowledge to Australia for for our own sort of rare earth type deposits. Um, the final sort of opportunity I want to touch on is is, is the coastal zone, um, and the coastal zone, as it's shown here, is a sort of a an un, underexplored frontier in hydrogeology and hydrology and even in geology. Typically, it's a little bit difficult to to understand this zone or to collect the data. You know, some of the geophysical techniques, and that's sort of shown in this picture at the left here. You know, a continental margin OFG stands for offshore freshened groundwater in these some of these um, underwater aquifers. Uh, SD, SGD is, is um, I can't remember exactly that, but it's groundwater you know, coming out of the out of the seafloor. So um, make make up the acronym that suits you for that. <laughs> I can't remember. Anyway, so so it's aspects of these, you know, I think there's a real recognition that uh, you know, some of these offshore aquifers can have potential lots of fresh water, uh, and they are potentially a resource, uh, uh, you know, for for the future. Um, I know some of the discussions we had with the groundwater team a few weeks ago recognised the Perth Basin, for example, probably has some of these freshened groundwater aquifers. Uh, the knowledge of them is based 
largely on modelling, um, and there's very little of the um, the constraints that uh, that would come from drilling these samples. But again, drilling in these environments is challenging because a it's offshore. The typical uh, IODP research vessels are too big to get into that shallower water, uh, and don't you know just can't operate in those sort of water depths. So there's there's opportunities potentially through ICDP through these mission specific platforms where you know the Europeans contract specific vessels or like a jack up rig that puts feet on the seafloor and, and jacks itself up so it's nice and stable. Um, one example of a I guess an expedition from uh, from a decade or well, yeah a decade or so ago uh, is this IODP expedition 313 which was off New Jersey after uh, the northeast of the US. Uh, you can see here a map of, uh, of New Jersey and there was uh, several of these these holes drilled which was one of the first, I guess, of these scientific drilling expeditions where they sampled fresh and groundwater, uh, very low salinities, um, evidence for lots of multi-layered reservoirs. Uh, and, and what the, the image shows at the bottom here is, I guess, one of the first sort of, I, I guess, uh, well, in this case, it's chlorine concentration uh, in, in, the, uh, in the aquifers here. The dashed lines in this picture are all modelled values. And the point was that before this drilling happened, there were no physical constraints to help constrain those, those models. So by having that data, um, we can understand those offshore aquifers much better. And the same would be the case of these things uh, off, off Australia in the Perth Basin, for example. Another spin-off of this, uh, there's an example here of, uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, looking at wind farm development off this, this part of the New Jersey coast as well. The yellow box here shows where those IODP sites are. The red box shows areas that are uh, being looked at for, um, uh, for wind farm, offshore wind farm development. Uh, and the same samples and data from that IODP expedition, much later than the expedition itself, ended up proving to be a valuable part of the geotechnical studies uh, to set up for those, those wind farms. So there's other spin-off benefits from this kind of work as well. So they went out and did their own kind of holes for industry, but they found out they weren't good enough, so they had to go back and use the IODP. It's going to be one of the uh, at least America's largest wind farms. So, well, I'll just repeat that as well for, for those online. So Sarah's just added as well that you know this region is going to be one of the US's largest wind farms. Uh, the, these geotechnical companies went out and collected their own or did their own um, coring, uh, but they found that the um, the IODP samples were, were much better and far more reliable and far more useful in the long term. Uh, the last example I want to touch on here again in this coastal zone is, is submarine slides. Um, in, in earlier this year, in, in, in January, the Europeans and the Japanese uh, ran a workshop uh, looking at some of the ideas for, for, for future drilling proposals. And in the natural hazard sort of discussion groups, one of the most discussed uh, hazards was submarine slides. Um, you know, typically we would think of earthquakes, subduction zone earthquakes, volcanoes, but you know, this is this is obviously something that's pretty important as well. Um, you know, these submarine slides are a Sure, well, that keeps going away. Um, submarine slides are a you know, hazard that are relevant to the coastal zone. You know, if we, we have mass movements of sediments in, in the offshore, we can create tsunamis, can damage critical infrastructure like these communication cables that are very important on the seafloor today. Um, and I'm not sure if the information here is, is completely you know, sort of up to date or, or they've found all the information, but what's shown in these two maps is, is the top map shows uh, where there is uh, samples that can help constrain, the, I guess, the, uh, the characteristics of the weak planes that, uh, that lead to these slides. Um, in both maps, the Australian dots are, are black, meaning there's, there's no data or no information, but I know that these, um, these slides have been examined in various uh, investigator and probably southern surveyor voyages uh, over the last you know, couple of decades. So there's potentially an opportunity here to get you know, for the communities involved in these submarine slide hazards to engage with the international community and ultimately potentially use some of these, uh, these examples as, um, as case studies of understanding these hazards. And again, that would be about you know taking our expertise overseas and, and and bringing in that sort of knowledge to Australia as well. Okay, so the last sort of slide here is about these these virtual expeditions, um, and uh, I guess this is a, a concept of uh, collecting information about the subsea floor, the subsurface, uh, without actually uh, without actually going and collecting new core. Um, and it's an opportunity to increase the scientific ocean drilling, you know, the knowledge that we get from that through you know, different ways of looking at discovery and innovation, innovative capacity, inclusivity, getting more people involved. Because not everybody can go out on an expedition uh, for two months to, uh, to work on these expeditions. So I guess the sort of the, the virtual expedition concept, you know, the, the thing that most people seem to think about is, OK, well, we can go to the core repositories. We can get out lots of samples for a particular time interval. 
and look at them all at once, apply new modern techniques to uh, some of those, those legacy cores and try and get a better understanding. Um, there's other examples there, you know, um, you know actually, you know, getting new data from those samples, which is the same sort of thing uh, that might help enable some of these land to see things or looking at that, those ex extraterrestrial connections um, and, and work, for example, which is ongoing already to focus on calibrating some of these fossil datums from the microfossils and the age models in the, in the, um, in the ocean basins. Um, there's also the op opportunities here to combine, you know, I guess, in that you know, the, the expertise of software engineers with uh, you know, with the IODP expertise to uh, uh, you know, answer some of these, um, these, these problems that IODP is trying to address. Um, and you know, what are the benefits from new technology, computing and storage infrastructure and that kind of thing. And in Australia, groups like the Earthbike Group at the University of Sydney are already leaders in a lot of that space. Um, you know, these, these archives of data for, from five decades or more, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of data there. You know, it's, it's, it's all very accessible. Um, but there's still questions about, you know, how can we improve the, uh, the, you know, the quality assurance, the quality control of that data, bring it all together, uh, make sure it is genuinely fair data. Um, and, uh, and, you know, there's, so there's still work in that sense of, of, you know, not needing to go and collect more data. Let's work with what we've got at the moment. Happy to talk more about that uh, afterwards as well, if anyone has any questions. Uh, but look, the, the very last thing that I'm going to talk about here is, is setting the pathway forward. And this is, I guess, a little advertisement here for our, our future deep earthquake. So drilling to ex earthquake, <laughs> future deep, deep workshop, <laughs> um, uh, drilling to explore Earth's past. So we're, we're aiming to bring together the ANZIC community and, and others uh, to a, a workshop in Hobart on the 3rd and 4th of April to, to, you know, to sort of try and set the pathway forward. What ideas have people got for new drilling proposals? How can we uh, facilitate the implementation of existing proposals uh, as, as we go forward? Um, and that would include the, the, the continental drilling program as well. And I'm really keen to hear if anybody's got ideas for, for scientific sort of drilling on the continents, because we haven't had that ICDP membership in the past, uh, but it would be good to know what sort of ideas people have got in that sort of space. So the workshop itself, uh, again, it's, it's open to anybody, free registration. Um, there is a, a call gone out for uh, early career researchers to get a subsidy to attend that, that workshop. Um, so again, if you know anybody who might benefit from that, um, you encourage them to have a look. Um, the workshop will start, we'll just have a bit of an icebreaker and, uh, and then um, the first day of the workshop will be hybrid. So you can also sign in from remotely from Canberra and uh, listen to the sort of the plenary discussion discussions outlining you know, the, the broad science plans, the different drilling programs, the, 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 the platform options that we've got um, and the different capabilities. Um, the second day it's really going to focus on breakout sessions, you know, focusing on some of these, you know, what proposals have we got in particular regions? Maybe there's some very advanced proposals. What can we do to get them over the line? Uh, how are we going to go about getting the site survey data that's essential for the, as, a, as a prerequisite to these, these drilling proposals? Um, so yeah, registration is open for that. Uh, again, happy to have a chat about that uh, if you like. It'd be great if we could, uh, we could see some of you there. All right, so I've, I've pretty much come to the end. Uh, just again here, uh, if you've got any questions about any of this, any of the scientific ocean drilling stuff, uh, you know, the, the ANZIC consortium is made up of 20 partners, uh, GA is included. Uh, you can see our contact details there. Um, we're all here today except for Jen, uh, who, who works part-time, uh, but Kelly's down the back and, and Sarah, you've already heard speaking as well. So yeah, uh, happy to, to, to reach out. And again, like I said, we're gonna, we're gonna be able to stay around a bit longer. So if anyone wants to have a look at some of the stuff we've got here, then, uh, then you, you're welcome to, to hang around. Um, the very last thing I just want to do here is uh, we've decided to uh, dedicate this ANZIC Roadshow this year to uh, my predecessor in this role, Leanne Armand. Uh, she was the director of ANZIC uh, from 2018 to 2022. And unfortunately, um, we lost Leanne uh, about a year ago, uh, but we're all building on the foundation that she's laid uh, for this scientific ocean drilling. And we really hope we can uh, continue that legacy for her and uh, keep Australia as a strong and valued partner in, uh, in these scientific ocean drilling and continental drilling programs. So I'll stop there. Thank you very much and happy to take questions.